All right, so is it recording? Awesome. So independent talk. We have to get very quickly to the enlightenment. And the enlightenment, this incredible time that happened in the 18th century, and it's really triggered by the scientific revolution no more than anybody else, Isaac Newton. And Isaac Newton laid out the mathematical formula for what? Gravity. Yeah, gravity. And his Principia Mathematica. Oh, if you like calculus, he's the one to perfect the calculus. Yes. Who likes calculus? Who hates calculus? Who will never be around calculus and will run away in fear? Okay. There was a calculus before, but he's the one who really laid out a, a usable calculus. And once that happened, all kinds of math happened. But Newton laid out the mathematical formula for gravity. And basically, he set the stage this idea that we now know how the universe functions. Everything functions by these nice, precise mathematical laws. And 99.9% .9 of the time, the mathematical laws work. That 0.1% insanity, but that's another story. And so if the whole universe operates that way. Can't society? Well, maybe not, but that's what they hope. I know you're shaking your head. Yeah, there's arguments with that, but they thought. And that was the enlightenment. Through logic and reasoning, we could take his ideas to society. And so Newton was really important in that effect. And so we could come up with natural laws to govern us. Put people in the situation where then we could use almost like mathematical formulas. And by the 1700s, they're designing cities that funnel people in certain areas and organize. They're designing buildings for these same purposes. They do it today. And as we all probably could guess, it has limited effect, but that's what they're sincerely hoping. And this is very much an idea of the elite. This is the elite pondering this, not necessarily talking to the actual people who get things done. And, oh, I forgot. I got out of order, scientific revolution. I knew we forgot something. So this rolls in very nicely with an idea that came a little bit from classics at Roman and Greek civilization, but humanism. This idea that people will decide their own fate. That is what the word sovereign means. Sovereign, we'll come back to this, but sovereign means people have the power over something. We ultimately decide what happens. And so this is the idea then that we have scientific laws. We can do this on our own. We can decide our fate, up or down, which in a way, agrees with the Protestant Reformation and predestination, and also kind of goes opposite of it. And a few more things. So this gets to a philosophy of the Enlightenment, where if we have natural laws that govern society and then govern the world, and Newton showed how the universe was created, there's a philosophy that is very close to religion, but it's a little bit different, called deism. Some of you might know this idea. Deism is going to become quite prominent by the middle of the 18th century, Many of the founding fathers were either full-fledged deists or very close to deists. And the idea was is that there is a creator, and the creator starts the universe. And it's obviously a very logical, rational creator, creator, as you can see by the mathematical formulas. And so the creator organizes this. In fact, it's like this. Creator organizes the universe. The universe is all, or I mean, there's all the planets, the people, every, you know, whatever's going to happen, all organizing it, sits back, looks at their creation, and then flips the switch and lets it operate under these mathematical formulas, and then sits back and lets it happen. Thus, humanism. People are sovereign. So there is not an interactive creator. The creator is sitting back and letting the people and everything else decide their fate. And that fit in very nicely with what Newton wrote about gravity to many people. Now, Newton didn't necessarily agree with this, but this is coming years after Newton died. And 
Clocks were the most technically advanced mechanical uh, instrument that humans could make at that time. So a clockmaker, really advanced, technical, complex, very difficult, universal clocks. And so if we are put on this planet and to decide our own fate and the creator sits back, then we can make the laws. We can make our decisions. I should add, if somebody is a deist, I mean a truly deist, I believe there is a creator who starts everything. By definition, they're not completely Christian if they're Christian, or not completely a Muslim, or not, you know, not completely Hindu, because those have interacting creators. You get the point there. And so there's going to be people like Thomas Jefferson, who was a deist, who will be criticized for not being Christian. And in a society that was majority Christian, especially after the First Great Awakening. George Washington, even though he always went to the Episcopal Church, Anglican, he never used the word God. He always used the word creator. That's deism. Do you notice it says creator in this? Jefferson. Now, that doesn't mean there wasn't actually a great first awakening influence on the Declaration of Independence. And a lot of people at these religious revivals were talking about we need democracy and equal rights for everybody. And so it was a complex time, but that's theism. So we decide our fate, not somebody else. And this would be personified by a lot of philosophers. We obviously, this is not a philosophy class. We're not going to go through all of them, but we must mention John Locke. John Locke. He's really like almost like right before the Enlightenment would have great influence on him. He's an interesting guy. He's going to try to justify the glorious revolution in 1689 where King James was kicked out and King William was put into power. How do you argue with this? And he is considered by many the father of liberalism. Liberalism comes from liberty. That term, in fact, they go hand in hand. Even though you're not going to see this really used until the French Revolution. And what is liberalism? And the term liberal therefore comes from that today. It means that everybody has certain natural rights. Certain natural rights. And that's the reason for government, to protect our rights. We have these certain rights. And what he said is King James II was dissolving these rights, and therefore he must be overthrown. We all have these rights. Now, what are these rights? He said life, liberty, and property. Remember I told you about property, how you're not truly free unless you own your own land, and therefore you won't be told what to do. That's what he meant. Even though, what if you don't have property? What's that? Yeah. So, and does that mean only people with property have the rights? I mean, it's really confusing. Is it? Well, that is why future philosophers will take that, take it from property to the pursuit of happiness, implying property is more broad than just simply on the piece of land. Because that can throw some things out. And Locke really also was kind of thinking, yeah, everyone is equal. We all have natural rights as long as you have property. Then you don't really have rights. He was, he was an elitist. But that's the Enlightenment. Locke had great effect on the United States. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. You read that last night or the period before as you're quick scrambling three minutes before the class started, right? Uh, that's all. all right. So let's get very quickly. Uh, we're not going to jump right there. It's a justified, get allies, but five people wrote the Declaration of Independence. And we'll get the first four. All we need to write down is the Committee of Five. They picked five people. Nobody wanted to write this thing because no one cared. They didn't think it was a big deal. Sure, they wanted to justify. Yeah, they wanted to send it off to France. But they picked John Adams and Ben Franklin. They were the two most prominent. They sent Ben Franklin. Franklin, by then, did not want to sit and write this. And John Adams wanted to go debate. And our, he liked to debate and argue. And he was one of those people, if he was in a good mood, he would argue, debate, be happy and jolly. He was in a bad mood. He was in a dark place. 
who want to argue? He'd probably be close to what we consider almost like bipolar disorder. It's just up and down. Franklin thought he was a lunatic. Robert Livingston of New York and Roger Sherman are going to be two very prominent patriots. Livingston is not as well known. Sherman's got a big deal with the Constitution. But then on John Adams' suggestion, they need somebody from Virginia. And he picked somebody who he had read his writing. He wrote the Virginia De Declaration of Religious Freedom, the charter to the University of Virginia. He didn't talk much. He was actually pretty shy, an introvert, Thomas Jones. And then what they did is Adams and Franklin, especially, you know, they wanted to do, you know, Franklin, they went to the Bay, go off to the city tavern, which is now part of the National Park Service within Philadelphia. Uh, I ate there. You can order food from the 18th century. Okay, that sounds like that. Preserved in the 18th century, you know, cooked in the style of the 18th century. Is that better now? It's, it was good, but a little bland. You know, whatever. It was fun. But, you know, debate the big events. That's what they thought people would remember. They didn't want to sit and write. It's going to be a lot of, especially the rough draft. Get the rough draft down, then they can all make changes. And so they went to Jefferson and tried to convince him to write it. How did they convince Jefferson to write this thing? You're the smartest one of us. Nobody knows more than you do. We could never write the way you do. This is going to be one of the most famous documents. It needs our best, most intelligent person. And you can imagine what Jefferson thought. You're right. I am the smartest person. So Jefferson sat in a little candlelit room and wrote it while they went and debated and argued. And he wrote the rough draft. So if you got the rough draft, that's one of the rough drafts. There's, uh, I think, three on display. At least the last time I was at the Library of Congress. It's really cool. And you can see where the other ones wrote, and they went and altered it. So all five wrote it. But Thomas Jefferson gets the majority of the credit because he wrote the rough draft that the whole thing's going to be based on. And he was very much influenced by Locke. Very much. And so that is the basis of it. I, I like this. Um, that equal uh, creation, that everyone's equal creation, that they're endowed by the creator. Somebody added that. Good line, really good line. But you notice creator, deism. There's a great effect of deism. It just shows there were different conflicting uh, ideas to this. And so while they wrote it, this is the actual, this is looking in Independence Hall, this cramped little area where the Congress met. And then up these stairs and off over, if you're looking at here, if you're back here, the actual colonial assembly was debating and arguing. And actually, at that moment, we, while they're writing the draft, they're replacing the Pennsylvania delegates with the new delegates that would eventually push towards revolution. It was a crazy time in Philadelphia. May, June, 1776. That's the chair. Picture didn't come out as well as I'd hope, but the picture that where Ben Franklin would sit during the debate. And we're going to jump right to here, the philosophy of the Declaration of Independence. We'll come back to when they declared it, but the philosophy. And that is the handbill that went around the country, the new country, as people were informed, hey, this unelected body just said we're now the United States. Yay! That's how they found out. I have a copy of it back there on that wall. And, but they wrote the Declaration of Independence, very much based upon Locke. And so everyone has a copy of the first part of the Declaration of Independence. If we're going to read this document, what's the first thing we do? Look at the date, who wrote it. We don't know who wrote it from this, but we know the main authors. We just did that. We just got some historical context. And the originally, originally Congress blamed everything on Parliament, the Continental Congress. But now they decide we're going to blame everything on the king. I'll tell you more detail tomorrow, so I have a good story about that tomorrow. But it's easier to blame one tyrant than 500 members of parliament. I mean, to this day, people still, if they want to uh, 
uh, criticize somebody, it's only a matter of time where they say, you're a Hitler. Even though they might have no idea why. Because it's easier to find this one tyrant and keep using that. Who's the tyrant? King George III. By any definition of 1776, he was no more a tyrant than any other king. He was not unusual, probably less of a tyrant than most. But he's our tyrant, so he's the tyrant. And so let's go and take a look at this. Uh, think about historical content, and then we start reading the document. And so let's read through it. So I'm going to ask someone to read. I'm going to get rid of this book. I have all kinds of stuff on here I never look at. Where should I put my clock? Did we talk about this yesterday? No. Yeah, I'm gonna ask my class where should I put my bird clock next I'm to the Huh? No, it doesn't make the bird noise. I know. The other side of the I thought about there, but it's hard to get to the cinder block. I don't know, it's a tough one, but I, want, I like my bird clock. It's got uh, one of my favorite birds, Stellar J. I mean, I, my parents who, my mom and dad did not realize what a sense of humor they had, but they named me my first and last name after birds. So, and I asked them about that and they said, eh, never thought of it. I would be a bird. bird. So, I'm gonna ask someone to read this. Uh, and the first part's pretty basic. But you'll notice something it says. Oh, let's get to it. Who would like to read the first part? I'm looking for a volunteer. Any volunteer? Go ahead, Mason. But in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with, the, with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. Good. Perfect spot. Well done. Just basically announced that we have real reasons to do this. But do you notice they said nature's law? That's deism. That's very much a deist idea. There are nature's laws. Nature's God. Now, does that, that really shouldn't change anything about it, no matter what your, your point of view. Why are you trying to give that idea of if they're thinking we can come up with rules? We can do this. So we have real logical reasons. And we're going to list them out. This is not just us whining and complaining. We don't like Britain. Man. But that can hurt my throat. But then we get to the meat of the philosophy. And there are three big parts of it. Three big parts. So I will have to stop you gently, but who would like to read the next part? Go ahead, Dan. Good. All men are created equal. What flew off? Oh, a magnet. So we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Is or was this self-evident? Absolutely not. This was pretty radical stuff. It was kind of this enlightenment idea, but there's this also kind of this populist idea that we should be equal, meaning one or two people shouldn't have all the stuff, all the food and all the wealth and all the clothing and all the heat and a better life for their children. We all should have this. I mean, this was pretty radical stuff. I should add that last part was not Thomas Jefferson. It was men like Thomas Paine. Oops. Put that up there. So the first point is equality. Now, this was kind of a throwaway too. A lot of white people were saying, we are, yes, equality. But equality doesn't mean we're all actually equal. It was more complex. What they meant was this. All men. They meant all men. But do you notice what? It's been 100 years since Bacon's rebellion. But he said all men. 
But Thomas Jefferson said that 100 years after Bacon's Rebellion, he meant all what kind of white men. He meant all white men. John Adams read that and said, all men are created equal. Some are more equal than others. That's what Adams wrote. And so they were not even in agreement, the five of them. Franklin was the same as Adams. Yeah, men of property are more equal. I mean, come on. Come on. But the great thing about this document is it grows. It is not frozen in time. And so we can look at this today as a significant number of people do. Of course, not everybody, but a significant number. And say, all humans. And you notice something else. It doesn't say citizens of the United States. It says all men. Now, Abigail Adams, she had read a draft, and she wrote a letter to her husband saying, uh, what about the women? And what was Adam's response? That's nice. Sure. But are you crazy? The point is, clearly, we're skipping at that time a little bit less than half the population. And so even then, they knew it, but we could say, now, it's all humans. And it was not close up. They knew it. Adams knew it. Others knew it. And thought, no, we couldn't do it. No, it's too controversial. So she noticed this. And a few more things. What does equality mean? A couple of things that comes out of this. As they saw equality under the law. Regardless of whether or not you're the king or the lowest per the lowest laborer, the jack tar, we're all equal under the law. So the king can't go beyond the law. Now, there's elements of uh, things aren't very true about that. Are we equal under the law? Now, technically, but it's, it's just, there's a big difference. If somebody like, let me throw someone out here. Who's under a big lawsuit for uh, um, mistreating laborers at a factory they own and blatant racism? Elon Musk. He can hire a thousand lawyers. Most of us probably can't. We, I couldn't hire more than two. No, not. I mean, <laughs> lawyers are incredibly expensive. He, they put all the... He, he, the areas of the Tesla factory in California, all the workers who were not clearly of European descent, they put in one area and they dumped the plantation. Oh. And that's where they did the worst jobs in the, in, in the Tesla factory. And they had, to, they had to move from California to Texas because of this, because it's Texas. It's not very slow. So, next. But does that mean equality of opportunity too? Does everybody have the same opportunity to achieve this society? Well, that's kind of what Jefferson was hoping. And in fact, in the early United States, you know, that's why there's no titles of nobility. But Jefferson was thinking this, we should all have the same opportunity, but what does that mean? When is it decided we have equality of opportunity? Because we are not all born equal. Jefferson was not born equal. <clears throat> Jefferson was the eldest son and inherited a large plantation and 250 slaves. He started out in a position where he never really had to work for the rest of his life. So he could put the, his time into invention and art and philosophy and he loved his fine wine. He could build a beautiful mansion and tinker with it for the rest of his life. It's hard to define opportunity. I mean, just imagine right now, we can all take a test on civics and government and history right now. That will decide how many votes we get. The better you do, the more votes in society. Who can run for office? Who will be a true citizen? We can all take, every one of us can take that test right now. So it involves a comprehensive knowledge of American history and government. Every one of us. And we'll all sit down and take the same test. 
exactly. Right now, we all sit down. Me, all of you, we take the same test. Equal, right? We all have the same opportunity. Now, who's going to do better than all of you? Not because I'm smarter or what? No, no. Not because I'm smarter. No, because I have an advantage. But didn't we all have the same opportunity? See the issue? It's hard to define this. Will this be an issue down the road in American history? No, nothing to see here. And when will this finally be decided? 2035. No, I never. It hasn't been yet. So there, there's an issue with that. But this is still pretty radical. We're equal? Wow. And what about slaves? A lot of Southern plantation owners who might have been, you know, patriots are going, uh, equality? What about the people we're beating death to death to work for us until they die? I mean, civilizing them. What about them? What if they look, read, hear about this document and say, oh, that sounds pretty good. Equality? I have rights? That's, what, that's the biggest reason why they restrict beating on plantations for slaves. Because they might read things like the Declaration of Independence of the United States, which is soon going to be banned in southern states because of that, of the United States. We have a lot of contradictions here, don't we? Doesn't make it good or bad. It's important to understand them. So let's get to number two, unalienable rights. So Tanner did a fine job, but now we need somebody else to read, starting with all men being created equal. And I will, of course, very gently stop you. I'm looking for a volunteer. Anybody? Or should I volunteer somebody? Who, pray tell, would like to read? Kate's looking at me, so I'll pick her. So I see people looking down and the people looking up. See, that's the way, if you don't want to be called on, there's two ways, right? We've all done this, haven't we? If you don't want to be called, you look down. Or you think, I'll look right at Then they won't call me. Who's done both of them? Yeah, me too. Who didn't even think of it until I told you? No, you've all, we've all done that. I'll look right and look at No, no. You're Where do you want me to look? I want you to look down while looking at me. <laughs> By the way, isn't that that's oh, that looks very psychotic, doesn't it? Okay, moving on. Start at equal. Life, liberty, they don't make magnets like they used to. And the pursuit of happiness. Unalienable right. First off, what does unalienable mean? Yeah. Cannot be taken away. What's that mean? Huh? Oh. Yeah. Cannot be taken away. We all have them. Unalienable. Where'd the magnet go? You won't fall next time. Yes, I've broken two of these for <laughs> Unalienable rights. They can't be taken away. We have them. We have them all. And there are three rights there. We all have them. Oh, almost forgot. So John Locke wrote Life, Liberty, and Property. Francis Hutchinson would be the one to say, no, property just sounds like accumulation of property. That doesn't sound very noble. Pursuit of happiness. That's different. That means, well, two things. First off, it implies it's just not greed and property. And secondly, what the heck does that mean? I don't know, but it sounds good. So let's get to the first one. What, pray tell, is life? Okay, now I know you're saying that, but lots of things are alive. Trees are alive. Cattle alive. Slaves are alive. So it's a little bit more, even though I know every time it's life, but what? So you mean like you guys have to work for a society or an acceptable Slaves are acceptable for a society. Slaves are acceptable. Like if you have slavery, you're on the right track though. 
Anybody else? What is different? So what is different between us right here, because none of us are slaves, and a slave? What's it between Thomas Jefferson and the slave? What does he have that the slave does not have? Land, power. Let's get to the most basic element. He has all those things, education and money and land. And, but what can Jefferson do on the most base element? And vote is another one. Say it again. And what decides that? He can decide his own fate. If he wants to stay, stays, goes, votes, not goes, education, not education. He decides that because he is not owned. It's independence. Ever got that? It's independence. So everything he said, people have got great answers. Those are all elements of independence, aren't they? I decide my own fate is not cold. It's not cold. Wait, what's this? Repeat after me. It's almost too hot in here. Say it, say it. Say it. Thank you. Now you feel better? Power of positive thank you. Oh, okay. Independence, I decide my own fate. Doesn't that fit in with the land thing? Slaves do not have that. Cattle, does, they do not have that. You plant or trees, whatever, they do not have that because you decide when to cut it down. No, we're independent. That is why Jefferson was completely opposed to wage labor. You work for a wage, you're dependent upon your boss, and you're no longer free. That's why he feared the Industrial Revolution when it started. He didn't mind the machines. He hated the Industrial Revolution. We'll get to that. So you, so you're independent, but you can't infringe on other people's independence. You can't say, I can do what I want, so I will enslave a free person. Now, I know what you're thinking. Wait a second. Aren't they doing that already? Don't bog yourself down with people. There's so many populations, right? I know. Jefferson was really guilty about this. But he didn't want to give up his wine. Next, liberty. What is liberty? It's more than freedom. Because freedom implies you, you basically your freedom to do what you want. I mean, what if I was free, do what I want, and my idea of freedom would be just to walk through these uh, aisles and uh, steal all your stuff? I'm here for you to stop me. You're on the light side. Why don't I do that? Not mean. Someone said more. Well, I, I, even if you're mean, you still might not do it. Have a mean person, but something stops you from doing that. Wow. And why don't I go through with a hammer and start beating you on the head? Because the somebody said. said it. Wow. But what decides your moral? Someone said it. Nice. Your conscience. That's what stops you. You don't murder people because there's a law. You don't murder people because of your conscience. You know what's wrong. Oh, you weigh the options too if I get in trouble. But also, your conscience decides whether or not you follow the law. The reason you're sitting in here and not leaving is your conscience. You've decided it's the right thing to do and you, you do the math. What kind of trouble I get, I go through the process of it. Is it the right thing to do? Is it worth it? Am I gonna learn stuff? Is this the hoops I have to jump through to get through society. When you laid out all of these options, that is your conscience. So, it's not just any freedom. Liberty is freedom of conscience. Freedom of conscience. That's what decides our fate. We follow that. Now, if you're not independent, you don't have liberty, period. Because you're always worried how this will affect others. And this is the way life is now. When you go off and go, if you have a job, 
you give up your liberty because you're not independent no longer, any longer. You have to obey. These are serious issues that weigh on us to this very day. Once again, can't bridge on others' rights, right? And let's get to the next biggie. What the heck is pursuit of happiness? <laughs> I totally forgot about that. But isn't it spelled yeah, like this? Yeah, it's spelled like a Y. Oh, uh, see? Based off the daycare. You might know what this means. Now, pursuit of happiness. This is kind of a tough one. But for think about property. Think about property. Everybody think right now to yourself, what is your most valuable property you have? No, really, what's your most valuable piece of property? My guess is probably not very few of you, if any, have land. Your phone. Is your phone? What's your most valuable piece of property? Is, really, is it really that's the most valuable piece of property you have? Everything you have, everything. So more valuable than your thumbs. What is the most valuable thing you have? My kidneys. <laughs> That ties everything together. Our most valuable piece of property. Now, don't say liberty or, or freedom conscious because that's another right. But how do you get money? How do you build and buy the phone? How do you get land? How do you get these things? How do you get kidneys? Okay, that's it. <laughs> you might be born with it. How do you know what to do if this is your labor? How do you know even what to do? <laughs> what? Yes, your forehead. <laughs> On the right, but that kind of leads into here. No. What about here? But what about that? What this? What decides your intelligence? All that. What if you're going to get lamb? What occupation you're going to do? How far you'll go? All of you are saying it's basically. What you can do with your hands, what you can do with your abilities. Uh, Pursuit of happiness is to go as far as your. So all you're giving great answers, but you think about it for a second. It's really how far your, you know, what you're born with, your hands, what you can do. You decide that fate because you have liberty. What your abilities? That's your most valuable piece. And so it's kind of is your point to your brain, and what you can do. And of course, not everyone has the same abilities. But you go as far as your ability to stay. And that fits in with this idea of equality of opportunity, which, of course, then we get to all, all the complexities of what that really means. You, you might have great abilities, but never have the ability to use it. But as far as this can go. And so that is better. That alleviates the problem of you need property to truly have rights. Of course, then again, there's some issues with that. But that does, don't forget, you can infringe on other people's rights. Because if your greatest ability was to come up from behind people, push them over, and rob them of all their stuff, you're infringing on their rights. I know what you're saying, but that's my ability. How dare you infringe on my rights? Well, figure it out. We got to give a few things up to live in this civilization. For freshmen, though, <laughs> or filming this? No, never. Okay. So. And don't forget, property is an element. If you if you don't own your property, you can never truly be independent if your property is not so. That is why in the United States Constitution, property is guaranteed. It's in the Constitution. Uh, I wonder if that would any effects on slavery. Moving on. Moving on. So we have equality. And now we have rights. And now the third part. So the third part, oh, and I use the great Patrick Henry quote, I know not what other paths men will take. But for me, give me liberty or give me death. 
he was a slaveholder. So there's contradictions everywhere. It doesn't mean he's not wrong and we can't be inspired by those words. We also can't forget the complexity of the time. That's the hard part about this. Jefferson really did formulate this great document and yes, he was a slaveholder. And so we can't forget either one. Oops. Third, the social contract. And this directly comes from Locke and a little bit of another French philosopher whom I don't really, I, I'm not sure if I like or dislike. Uh, Rousseau called the social contract. I might have put another picture of Locke. Locke, you know, I'm somebody, you know, and I, I blame my father. I got a relatively big nose. Locke must have had a big nose. And I've broken it twice. I would recommend not breaking your nose. So my nose was like this, and I broke it again and straightened up a little bit. Pretty cool, huh? So, who would like to read next? Who read the last time was Kate? Anybody? Volunteer. I'm looking for a volunteer. Okay, thank you. Right after happiness, where that line is. Right there. So the first element of the social contract is this. Did you catch that? To secure these rights, government governments. Oh, I'm not even bothered picking it up. Just picking it out. Stay there. Yeah. Governments get their consent from the government. So the reason why, whether you have a parliament or a constitution like we have, or a dictatorship, they still get their consent from the government. So we have to give up a little bit of liberty. Why? Yeah, well, not order, even though that might be the result. So you all have, we give up some liberty, so we all have what? Yeah, we all have liberty. It could be a lot of liberty or a little liberty. But we give up something to secure some rights. Now, some of you might be saying, wait a minute. You mean Joseph Stalin had the consent of the government when he, or Adolf Hitler? Gotta go to Hitler, right? They still, not really democratically, but constitutionally. Hitler had the consent of the government. They let him stay in power. Dictators are kicked out of office all the time. Now, they might be kicked out by being lynched, they might be hung, but the people still give them their power and they can remove them. And people will accept a lot of repression if they think they're getting some kind of benefit, AKA rights from it. So, next. Oh, the bell's getting pretty close to ring. We have one more part to read. Who would like to read the last part? You want to do it? Sure. Thank you, Jed. I appreciate it. Where are we? After the last one. The govern after the hy the hyphen. The whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, the right of the people to serve the law. Yeah. 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 Yeah
to send the Society for Rights of Guarantee to also national defense. So an enemy power can come in and impose, yes, and impose a dictatorship and elimination of rights. We have a little bit left to finish tomorrow. Sound good? So it will have to be next Monday. Review the test. We don't do a lot of reviews. Oh, would you like to review this for the test? I have a little review list. No, no, just have a short essay. And I'll explain you exactly what I want for a short essay. So a short essay is basically a paragraph. It's something I remember I stole from the professor of anthropology. Yeah, you're right. So this is a review list for the test. Now, I give you little hints on this. You might notice asterisks. Anybody want to guess what the asterisks are called? Essay. Short essay. I will explain exactly what I want. They're sticking together. I should be critical Yes. <laughs> That's the old water tank when this was for a volatile it's a civil defense. It's a nuclear war. What's up? Where are you going? Oh, wait, wrap, wrap. All right. Well, uh, you ready, kid? Uh, I'm basically, you're gonna have to read all of chapter five. And you have to review this because that's what we can finish up for like So I'll give you a couple of things to do. Sound good? And check teams, but I know you'd be busy and stuff. But yeah. Not one of Hey, you know what we did last night with the Master Health? Yeah. First of all, we read the Declaration of Independence. Wow. Second of all, memorize the first seven presidents. Seven? You got yeah. seven yeah. total? Yeah. So when we have to do it at the end of the year, it's going to be like, I'm in another. That's actually the way to do it. You do a little chunks. Yeah, right? that's what we were saying. So, so who, who's uh, the wait, first president? George Washington. Who's the? Uh, I didn't have a list And Andrew Jackson. Very good. You got him. Yes. We were, we were <laughs> practicing. That's excellent. <laughs> <laughs> it was so rude. <laughs> 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 Seven presidents. I am so. We never played. So I was a, a nut job and got two vaccines yesterday. Where the vaccine? I was thinking that was a joke before. Like you should cut your papers as shapes as it is.